Hi there, fellow Philhellenes. My name is Vivek Vasan from the Historical India Podcast, a chronological history of India and South Asia. Okay, I'll confess, I'm a bit of a podcast junkie and aspiring history nerd, like most of you, I'd imagine. And my playlist is full up with history podcasts covering nearly every civilization, culture, and time period. But in this pantheon of history podcasts, there was a gap. And as now you no doubt know, Ryan's done an incredible job filling that space with a detailed history of ancient Greece and the wider Hellenic world. He's given me company as I filled another gap in the lineup of history podcasts, one on India and South Asia. But most importantly, helped me ignore the length of my daily commute. So if you haven't done so already, please do drop a rating and write a review and follow the History of Ancient Greece on Facebook and Twitter. And check out the website. Because Ryan, after getting really stuck into the culture, society, religion, politics, war, and the architecture of the Hellenic world, introduced us, through Greek eyes, of course, to the other cultures and civilizations of the time. To the Egyptians, the Assyrians, Anatolians, more recently the Carthaginians, and now the Persians. The Persian Empire and civilization was another thing Ryan and I connected on. You can never have enough to say about the Persians. So when he offered me the chance to introduce his episode on Cyrus, I was really happy to do it. And wonderful timing as ever by Ryan, because over at the Historical India podcast, I am coming up to the eastern territories of the Persian Empire. The cities and kingdoms of Gandhara, Kambhoja, Madra, places today in Afghanistan, Pakistan and northwestern India places that sent their archers as part of the Persian army's forces during the wars with Athens. There were very likely soldiers from India on the Persian side at the battles of Marathon and Thermopylae. So it's only a matter of time before the Greek history machine, powered by Ryan Stitt, is going to come to India, or Indica as it was known to the Greeks. To the people here, the Greeks were the Yavana or the Yona, And Greek culture did leave its mark in the region for a long time to come. Now, Ryan and I have been in touch for some time, and we've been working on our episodes, and I've been trying to keep up with Ryan, and get as much covered as possible before that most famous encounter of Greek and Indian worlds, when Alexander confronted Porus on the banks of the river Hydaspes, now known as the Jhelum, so that we could do something together. Because history is the ultimate shared universe, and we've got loads of crossover potential. So, if you'd like to know more about India, South Asia, the people and places, along with obscure references to Terry Pratchett's The Discworld thrown in, and what was going on in the subcontinent before that eventful meeting, bucket loads of political and social change, and maybe stay on to see how it all turned out, you can find the Historical India podcast on iTunes and Stitcher and all the other places you get your podcast feeds. The website is historicalindiapodcast.com and the Twitter handle is at histoindicast. And now for something completely different. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 31, Cyrus the Great. When Aliati's son, Croesus, now the current king of Lydia, had received word that his brother-in-law, had lost his kingdom to a young upstart king from an obscure Aryan vassal tribe. He must have credited it to the betrayal of Astyages and not to the quality of the Persians themselves. The usurper was Cyrus, a man who was to become one of the world's greatest conquerors. But the revolution at first must have signified little more than a dynastic change, as the Medes and Persians were peoples of the same race and the same faith, Croesus must have believed that the Persians surely were no match to the loyal and disciplined army that his famous wealth commanded. He had spent the past decade of his reign, as we covered in episode 15, consolidating Lydian control over Anatolia, having conquered Ephesus, and seen Lydia become even more prosperous as Lydian metallurgists had begun to make metals of purity that had never been seen before. Thus, with the Medes now being kingless and unsure of their loyalties, The Halys River transformed from a border between the Lydians and the Medes into just another river, and Croesus believed that all of northern Mesopotamia looked ripe for the picking. Even with the pretext of invasion, being to avenge his brother-in-law, and coming to the aid of his sister, 
Croesus had no intention of launching a war without making sure that the deck was not stacked overwhelmingly in his favor. Although the Ionian Greeks held a special affinity for Croesus, as he was a benefactor to the Hellenic world, still, he feared that they might take advantage of his absence to throw off his yoke and might even intrigue with the Persians. The Ionian Greeks, after all, were long accustomed to regard Media as a resort against Lydia and intrigued with the Median kings, as shown by the word Medism. For if such intriguing had first come into fashion after the rise of Persia, the name chosen to delineate it would naturally have been Persism. Anyway, first, he needed the divine will of the gods to know whether his cause was destined for success or doomed for failure. Thus, he loaded up wagons laden with treasure and sent ambassadors to consult the various oracles throughout the Hellenic world, most notably among them was Delphi, as well as the Oracle of Amun in Libya. He wanted to test them to see who gave the most trustworthy omens. He had his sacred delegates all dispersed from Sardis, and on the hundredth day from their departure, they were to consult their respective oracles about what Croesus was doing on that exact date. Then, they were to record in writing the responses they received. Only the reply of the Oracle of Delphi has been recorded, though. She said, I know the number of grains and sand and the measures of the sea. I understand the mute and hear the speechless. Into the depth of my senses has come the smell of hard-shelled tortoise, boiling in bronze with the meat of lamb, laid upon bronze below, covered with bronze on top. When Croesus received this response, he rejoiced, for in fact on that day he had chopped up a tortoise and a lamb and then boiled them together in a bronze cauldron, covered by a bronze lid. Afterwards, Croesus tried to please the god of Delphi with generous offerings. He sacrificed 3,000 of every kind of appropriate animal. He also piled up all sorts of gold and silver cups and royal purple garments and burned them on a huge pyre. All of this he did in order to gain Apollo's favor. He then sent over a hundred gold ingots and a statue of lion made of pure gold, weighing ten talents, all to Delphi. Along with these were two craters of enormous size, one gold and one silver, that set on the outside of the temple's entrance. The messengers then asked the Pythia if Croesus should wage war against the Persians and whether it would benefit him to seek additional alliances. Here, Herodotus relays what would become one of the most famous oracle responses to come out of antiquity, as a messenger returned from Delphi with the reply, If you attack the Persians, you will destroy a great empire. Thus, for a supremely confident Lydian king, this was exactly the response that he had been hoping for, believing that the great empire that would be destroyed would be that of Cyrus, not of his own. Furthermore, in regards to his second question, the guidance was for Croesus to find the most powerful Greek city and make them his friend and supporter. For someone who was so plugged into the Hellenic world as Croesus, the answer to who was obvious. Without delay, he sent messengers to the Spartans to seek a military alliance. When Croesus' offer arrived over the winter of 548-547 BC, the Spartans promptly negotiated an alliance with the Lydian king pledging their support against the Persians. Unfortunately for Croesus, it was an oath that would never be fulfilled, since the Spartans instead chose to gear up to fight against Argos, as we discussed in episode 22. But Croesus didn't know that, and so, back at his palace in Sardis, amid preparations for war, Croesus surveyed the terrain of the known world and found increasing confidence. Formal agreements held both the Spartans and the Babylonians as his allies. The pharaoh Amasis II, though he was no friend of Babylon, held close ties to Lydia, so they joined in the alliance too. Amasis II couldn't afford to see the balance of power destroyed and ultimately wished to get rid of Babylon once they dealt with the Persian menace. In the fight against eastern barbarism, even the Ionians flocked to Croesus' side. Thus, he had many allies volunteering to serve in his army, including the great philosopher Thales of Miletus, and of course, he had the promise that a great empire was about to be destroyed. In the fall of 547 BC, Croesus led his forces eastward out of Sardis. Two aspects of his campaign were unusual. First, that it began so late in the year, and second, that he didn't call on the support of his foreign allies. The reason for the timing remains unclear, but he may have had full confidence in the capability of his native forces, while also wanting to avoid sharing in the many spoils to come. In Cappadocia, near the unbridged river Halys, Croesus was at a loss as to how his army would cross the river, so he engaged the intellect of Thales, 
who recommended that they dig a diversion upstream so as to reduce the river's flow. With lesser channels now running along both sides, the army was able to cross the Halys. This action formally broke their treaty with the Medes, and so, with the war officially declared, he continued eastward. The first Cappadocian city that Croesus arrived at was Pateria, which sat on the Halys River directly south of the Greek colony of Sinope, which was on the Black Sea coastline. After making a camp outside the city's walls, he laid waste to their fields, stormed the city of Pateria, and enslaved its inhabitants, a clear sign of the fate for anyone who would oppose him. Meanwhile, the Persian king was not sitting idle. Upon hearing the rumors of Lydia's military buildup, Cyrus decided to launch a preemptive strike of his own. Moving north along the Tigris and west via the Median stronghold of Haran, he quickly took and occupied the Anatolian territory of Cilicia, which technically put him into a state of war with Babylon. We will deal with that later. From there, the Persian forces marched northward to confront Croesus outside of Pateria. A decisive battle, thus, was to be fought in Anatolia. Both kings had enormous, highly motivated, and highly skilled armies. One was destined to cast his shadow across the entire Near East, while the other was prophesied to destroy a great empire. Persian military tactics traditionally employed archers and slingers first to soften up the opponent before sending in the infantry and cavalry, as opposed to the Lydians, who fielded a much larger cavalry, alongside tough spearmen. The ensuing battle was hard fought and bloody. With no solar eclipse this time, it carried on until nightfall, but the result was still the same, a stalemate with heavy casualties on both sides. On the next morning, Croesus surrendered the field and returned with his remaining forces to Sardis. Since winter was coming soon, it would afford him the necessary time to rethink his strategy against a surprisingly capable Persian king and invoke his alliances including the Egyptians, Babylonians, and Spartans, in order to bolster his reserves. Thus, over the winter of 547-546 BC, Croesus dispatched heralds to his allies, requesting them to send aid in four months' time, and he dismissed his Anatolian mercenaries for that time as well. Thus, it is hard to overestimate his surprise when in the depths of winter, Cyrus arrived with the remainder of his army at the walls of Sardis because the concept of constant year-round warfare was unnatural and alien at this time, as most adhered to the tradition of seasonal campaigning. But Cyrus had followed the Lydian army back to Sardis, and laid in wait for months, until Croesus had dismissed his reserves. He then announced his presence. After traveling a huge distance from his Persian homeland, and enduring the hardship of Anatolian winters, Cyrus wouldn't settle for anything less than total victory. Although he was caught off guard, Croesus was far from helpless. He was on his home turf, and his regular standing army still numbered 420,000 in total. In addition to the Lydians, Croesus' army included Phrygian and Cappadocian auxiliaries, Greek mercenaries, and additional troops that had arrived early from Babylon and Egypt. Opposing them was Cyrus' army of Persians, Medes, Arartians, and Arabian mercenaries that numbered 196,000 in total. All of these numbers are according to the later Greek historian Xenophon, and are probably exaggerated. In any event, Croesus outmatched Cyrus's forces two to one when they gathered on the plain of Thymbra, to the north of Sardis. When Cyrus saw the Lydians lining up for battle, he grew apprehensive at the number of their cavalry. Always open to unconventional tactics, Cyrus heeded the advice of his old friend, the former Median general Harpagus, to arrange his troops in a great square formation with his baggage camels in the front ranks. He removed their baggage and mounted men on top of them. The cavalry was then placed in the rear, behind the infantry. When both sides had collapsed on each other, as was predicted, the Lydian horses were distracted by the strange odor and the sight of the camels, and fragmented into disarray. From there, everything went bad for the Lydians, as their army relied the most on their cavalry. Disorder was increased by the effective overhead fire of the Persian archers, stationed within the square. Cyrus then gave the order for the attack, and his flanks smashed into Croesus' disorganized wings. The Lydians, though, didn't flee cowardly. They leapt off their horses and engaged the Persians on foot, but this would be to no avail. After both sides enacted heavy losses, the Lydians were soon routed, and Croesus ordered a retreat behind the walls of Sardis.
Croesus sent out immediate pleas to his allies for help, but these requests fell on deaf ears. The Spartans were already in the midst of war preparations with Argos in what would be called the Battle of Champions. Despite this, though, they made immediate preparations to come to his aid. But when their ships were ready to sail, another message arrived that Sardis had fell and Croesus was being held captive. The Persians had surrounded Sardis, a city built to be impregnable, as the only way in was through the front gate. It rested on tall hills with heavy fortification walls, and its only undefended point was at the rear, which overlooked a very tall cliff wall that faced Mount Tamalus. But the Persians were raised in the mountains of the Iranian plateau, and they scaled the wall successfully in the cover of darkness, and took the city by surprise, just two weeks into the siege. As the Lydian capital fell, Croesus bitterly realized that the great empire that he was destined to destroy had been his own. Only three years after the conquest of Media, Cyrus had won another incalculable victory over a vastly superior force and claimed a second Near Eastern empire for the Persians. Cyrus had given strict orders that Croesus was not to be slain in the taking of the city. The story goes that when a soldier, who didn't recognize him, was about to cut him down, one of Croesus's sons, who had been unable to speak since birth, suddenly burst out, Do not slay Croesus. He was thus spared and dragged before Cyrus in chains. But unlike Estiages, Croesus was not a fellow Arian, and there was no political gain in keeping him alive. Just as this treatment of Astyages had been a lesson in clemency, the fate of Croesus showed the penalty for resistance. A great pyre was heaped in the capital, and Croesus was tied to a stake. The fire was lit, and as the flames began to ascend, he cried out to Apollo for aid. Then, in a horrible lamentation, he began to repeat the name of Solon over and over again. Having no knowledge of the Lydian tongue, Cyrus asked his interpreters to explain the meaning of this cry. They asked him who was Solon. He said, a man to whom I would pay a fortune if only he could talk to all kings. They continued to press him until finally Croesus relented and told him the tale of Solon's earlier warning on the fickleness of fortune that you should count no man happy until he was dead. Cyrus was moved by this, reflecting that he too was human and was subject to the same fate. So he wished to spare Croesus' life, but it was too late as the pyre was already lit. But as befitting a ruler of legendary standing, rumors later spread that Croesus had been rescued at the last minute by Apollo, with varying accounts of what happened next. Bacchylides mentions that he was spirited away by Apollo to the Hyperboreans. Herodotus relies the traditional Lydian account that Apollo had sent a violent rainstorm to extinguish the flames and thus save his life, presumably on the account of his previous piety to the god of Delphi. When Croesus was brought down from the pyre, Cyrus asked him why he chose to wage war against him rather than becoming his friend, to which Croesus famously replied, What I did was a blessing for you, but a curse for me. The one to blame is the god of the Hellenes. It is he who encouraged me to go to war. Otherwise, no one could be so foolish as to prefer war to peace. In peace, sons bury fathers. In war, fathers bury sons. Surely this all happened by divine will. Afterwards, he was made a trusted advisor to the Persian king. But the Nabonidus Chronicle, the most reliable record of the age, ends both the life and reign of Croesus in the winter of 547-546 BC upon the burning pyre. He was 48 years old and had ruled Lydia for 14 years, taking with him the last and best hope for Anatolian rule over the Near East. Following the sack of Sardis, Cyrus's troops started plundering and looting the city. Cyrus sought the counsel of his new advisor, Croesus, who told him that he needed to stop them immediately, because whoever accumulated the most wealth will likely rebel against him. Thus, Cyrus posted spearmen at each gate, and had them remove the plunder from the men carrying it out under the guise that it was to be given to Zeus, so that they would not hate him for taking things away by force, and would have to admit that he was acting justly, and thus surrender what they had gathered. For a payment, Cyrus allowed the bitter Croesus to send the shackles which had been used to imprison him back to Delphi in order to reproach the god. When the Lydian envoys arrived and sent their message to the Pythia, she responded, Fate at destiny is impossible to avoid even for a god. Croesus had to atone for the wrong of his ancestors, four generations ago, 
Although Apollo strove to delay the fall of Sardis until after Croesus was dead, he was unable to deflect the fates. And in addition, it was Apollo who rescued Croesus from burning on the pyre. Of course, we are referring to the curse placed on the Lydian ruling line after Gyges had killed Candales. See episode 15 for more details. So the Pythia here is saying that there is nothing that they could have done and no amount of lavish gifts or piety from Croesus would have changed anything. It was fated and even the gods are subject to fate. When Croesus heard the oracle's response, he confessed to Cyrus that it was he, not Apollo, who was in the wrong. Back in Greece, the capture of Sardis came as a complete shock. So great had been the wealth and might of Croesus that none thought his overthrow was possible. The sheer and sudden fall into nothingness made perhaps a deeper and more abiding impression on the imagination of the Greeks than any other historical event. It was the most illustrious example that the Greeks had ever witnessed of their favorite motif in action. The gods humble those men who are approaching what it means to be a god. And the personality of Croesus himself crept into their sympathies. He was a Philhellene, or a lover of Greek things. He admired Greek art and wisdom, worshipped Greek gods, and generously gave out lavish gifts to Delphi. For nobody else but Croesus did the Greeks weave around chronology in order to create an event of tales around his life, which have a deep and touching impact as lessons for the life of men, such as his apocryphal conversations with Solon. In doing this, Herodotus uses this powerful and wealthy man to show the fickleness of human life and how vanity and self-absorption can lead one to misconstrue what he is being told, and thus lead to his downfall. Furthermore, the fall of Croesus was mirrored by the destruction of the great object upon which he had pinned his hopes for conquest, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. It had burned to the ground in the fall of 546 BC. Regardless of how this occurred, its symbolism was clearly ominous. The Kingdom of Lydia and the Oracle of Delphi had both been unshakable rocks of stability. Between them, they served to define the periphery and the core of the Hellenic world. The destruction of both in a single year could only mean that the Greeks were about to enter a period of grave danger and uncertainty. They would soon put a name to this existential threat. The Persians. The Kingdom of Lydia had performed a certain function in the development of Greece. Besides the invention of coinage and the luxury exercised in Ionia, the mere existence of a Lydian kingdom in its intermediate position between Greece and the Near East, was of considerable importance as a bulwark against the great Near Eastern empires. It kept Greece from coming into direct contact with the Assyrians, and for 60 years from coming into direct contact with the empire of Media. When the barrier was broken down, a new period gushed forth in Greek history. They now stood face to face with a monarch whose dominion stretched far away beyond the Euphrates and Tigris into lands which were totally unknown to them and the Ionian Greeks were forced to adapt quickly to this new state of affairs. They sent messengers to Cyrus at Sardis to convey their wish to be subject to him on the same terms that they had with Croesus. Cyrus told their messengers a story in response. There was a flute player who saw some fish in the sea and played his flute to them, thinking they would come out onto the land. But when his expectation proved to be mistaken, he took a fishing net, caught a great number of them, and then watched the fish writhe and quiver on the ground. He told the fish to stop dancing for him now, since they refused to come out and dance before. The message was clear. Since Cyrus had asked the Greeks to assist him against Croesus, and they refused, they have lost their chance to maintain their same privileges. They would refuse to meet eyes, not perhaps from loyalty to Croesus, but because they did not anticipate his utter overthrow. When news of Cyrus' response had reached the Ionian Greeks, they all began to build bigger walls, except for the Milesians. Thales had advised his fellow Milesians not to fight alongside the Lydians on the plain of Thimbra, even though the other Ionians had. It's possible that his experience at Pateria had convinced him that the Lydian cause was already lost. But because of this, they were allowed to enter into terms with Cyrus on the same terms they had with Croesus. Anyways, after the fall of Sardis and hearing Cyrus' response, Thales then advised the other Ionian Greeks to form a defensive coalition against the eminent Persian threat. Thus, the twelve Ionian cities created what modern scholars call the Ionian League, or the Pan-Ionian. From south to north, they were Miletus, Myus, Priene, Ephesus, Colophon, Lebedus, Teos, Clazomenae, Phocaea, Samos, Chios, and Erythrae. 
Thales died within the year, though, with his philosophical legacy being far more secure than his political one. The Ionians, though, may have met in their Panionic Assembly, or the Assembly for All Ionians, but they seem to have been without the ability or the organization to carry out any plan of common action, especially without much help from Miletus. Seeing this, Thales had put forth the remarkable proposal that Ionia should form itself into a united nation, with one council and one place of assembly, each city surrendering her sovereignty and becoming merely a town or deem of the state and he suggested Teos as the fitting place for the capital. The idea, whether it was put forward by Thales or not, was assuredly suggested by the political development of Attica, the mother country of the Ionians. Another proposal, which was made in one of the ineffectual meetings of the Pan-Ionian, received the approval of Herodotus. Bias of Priene advised all of the Ionians to sail forth together to the west, to the island of Sardinia, and there found an Ionian state where they could live happy and free. This proposal was rejected, but it illustrates the terror and despair of Ionia at the prospect of Persian rule. Meanwhile, although they had began defensive measures, the Ionians by common consent decided to send messengers to Sparta, asking for help in their inevitable war against Cyrus. The Spartans were still riding high on their victory over Argos when they heard about the fall of Croesus. Although they were shamed by their broken vows to the former Lydian king, they were still reluctant to commit forces overseas. As Argos was still around, it could always stir up a pesky helot revolt, and thus they decided to rely upon the power of intimidation that had served them well at home. A delegation of Spartans was thus dispatched to meet with Cyrus at Sardis. In his presence, these envoys shunned all diplomatic niceties and delivered a simple message, telling him to leave the Greek cities of Ionia alone, or he will answer to the Spartans. Cyrus summoned a local Ionian attendant, and asked him in front of them, Who are the Spartans, and how many of them are there? When he heard their response, he said to the Spartan herald, I have never yet feared any men who have a place in the center of the city set aside for meeting together, swearing false oaths, and cheating one another. And if I live long enough, Sparta will have troubles of their own, about which to converse, rather than those of the Ionians. Cyrus thus insulted the Greeks because of their custom of setting up agoras in their cities, for the purpose of buying and selling, which is unknown among the cities of Persia. The delegation returned home humiliated and angry. A generation would pass until they had an opportunity to avenge this insult. After ordering the death of Croesus, or making him an advisor, whichever story you prefer, Cyrus spared the Lydians, intending to rule his new empire with a light and respectful hand. He installed a Persian noble named Tabalus as Sardis's new governor, or satrap, and entrusted a local Lydian aristocrat named Pactius to oversee the management of the gold. Then, leaving behind a military garrison in the capital, in 545 BC, Cyrus led the bulk of his forces back to Ecbatana, along with Croesus, as he considered the Ionians of no importance for the present and was instead planning to make expeditions southward. But before he had hardly left, he heard that Pactius, had used his access to the treasury to recruit Lydian and Ionian mercenaries in order to lead an uprising against Tobolus and the Persian garrison, who found themselves now confined to the Acropolis of the city. An enraged Cyrus immediately sought advice from Croesus on how to handle the Lydians, in order to ensure this never happens again. He said that perhaps it might be best for him to reduce them to slavery, because he feels like someone who has killed the father but spared the children. Herodotus here has Cyrus allude to a well-known Greek proverb, Foolish is he who kills the father but leaves the children behind. Croesus, though, saves the Lydians from Cyrus' wrath by convincing him to direct his anger at Pactius. However, he also advised him to prohibit the Lydians from possessing weapons of war, order them to wear tunics under their cloaks and soft boots, instruct them to play the lyre and the harp, and force them to educate their sons to be shopkeepers. Essentially, the Lydians should turn their minds to luxury, so that they would become effeminate, and thus pose no danger or threat to any future rebellion. With this, Cyrus thus was persuaded not to enslave the entire Lydian population. With his anger abated, Cyrus continued on to Ecbatana and dispatched his senior infantry commander, Mazaris, to put down this revolt and press upon those involved the price to be paid for disobedience. Mazaris was tasked with the order to carry out the steps which Croesus had advised, 
as well as to enslave all those who had joined the revolt against the Persians. Pactius was to be taken alive back to Cyrus. As the Median army approached, Pactius fled to Chaim, laden with Lydian gold and begging for sanctuary from the newly formed Ionian League. When he arrived at Sardis, Mazarus compelled the Lydians to follow Cyrus's instructions to change their entire way of living. He then sent messengers to Chaim demanding that Pactius be handed over to him. The Chimaeans decided that they neither wanted to be destroyed for handing over Pactius, for they feared a response from Apollo for robbing his temple of a suppliant, nor to be besieged for keeping him. So they sent him off to Mytilene. Like a game of hot potato, the Mytilenians decided they didn't want to burn their hands either, so they sent him to Chios. The Chians, however, apparently weren't worried about divine punishment, because they handed him over to Mazaris. In exchange, the Persians gave Chios possession of the district of Atarnius, which sat on the coastline opposite of the island of Lesbos. Pactius was then sent back to Cyrus, who by this point had already made it back to Ecbatana. His fate is not recorded, but he was likely tortured to death. Mazaris then proceeded to make war on those who had joined in the siege of Sardis. He first besieged and captured Priene. Their inhabitants were enslaved. He then invaded the entire plain of the river Meander and gave it over to his army to plunder. Next, Mazaris did the same to Magnesia and its inhabitants, and just like he did with Priene, he also gave over the territory of Magnesia for plunder. Magnesia lied about 15 miles from Miletus and was not a member of the Ionian League. Thus, Mazaris was sending a clear message that all of the Greek cities were now targets. Shortly thereafter, Mazaris died suddenly of illness, so Cyrus dispatched his most senior general, Harpagus, to finish the job. For the next three years, he raised the Ionian countryside, conquering territory after territory and city after city with ruthless and mechanical efficiency. He did so by employing earthworks. Whenever he had forced the people of the city to shut themselves up within their walls, he would then pile mounds of earth up against the walls and deployed mountain climbers to scale the city walls as he laid siege to the city. This is an example of the Persian adoption of Mesopotamian technology and science, in this case siege equipment and procedures, to use against the Greeks, whose cities had previously been impregnable against each other and against the weapons and tactics of hoplite warfare. Harpagus' initial attack was against Phokia. As we discussed in episode 14, the Phokaeans were the first of the Greeks to open up Gaul and Iberia for trade when they colonized territories in the far western Mediterranean. When Harpagus prepared to besiege the Phokians, they hauled their pentaconters down to the sea and loaded every one of them with their women, children, and movable goods. They loaded up their statues and offerings from their sanctuaries and sailed to Chios. The Persians thus gained possession of an empty city. In effect, they chose to relocate their polis instead of living under Persian rule. They first tried to buy the Onusai Islands from the Chians, which sat directly between them and the mainland, but the Chians refused. They were afraid that the Phokians would develop the islands into a center of commerce that would outstrip them. So the Phokians thus set sail for the island of Corsica in the central Mediterranean, where they had established a colony of Alalia a few decades prior. This new wave of colonization quickly led to hostilities with the Etruscans and Carthaginians, which we covered in detail in episode 28. The people of Teos reacted to Harpagus in a similar way. When he had taken their wall, he discovered that they too were already gone, for they had boarded their ships and sailed to Thrace. There, they landed at the city of Abdera, which, as we discussed in episode 15, had been founded earlier by Clazomeni, but were eventually driven out by the Thracians. So the Teans refounded the city and kept the same name. These were the only Ionians who chose this path. Those who stayed behind faced the challenge of resisting Harpagus. They fought courageously, but suffered defeat and conquest and then stayed in their cities, submitting to Persian rule, all except for the Milesians, who, as we've seen, had sworn an oath to Cyrus and thus maintained special privileges. Although he showed mercy and tolerance to the conquered people, in keeping with Cyrus's wishes, The fiercely independent Anatolians had no interest in surrendering to any foreign ruler. Most were subdued without any trouble, though. Once Harpagus had conquered the mainland, Aeolian, Ionian, and Dorian Polis, those on the islands near the coast grew frightened and also submitted to Cyrus. Harpagus then turned south, and then east along the coast, to secure the neighboring territories of Caria and Lycia. Particularly of note, though, was Cnidus, 
a Greek city in the region of Caria. It sat on the Bybassian Peninsula, which would be completely surrounded by water, except for a narrow land bridge that connects it to the mainland. While Harpagus had been subjecting Ionia, the Canidians tried to dig through this strip of land, with the intent of making their own land an island. But they suffered many injuries in the process, because of the smashing of a rock. So they sent sacred delegates to Delphi, asking why this was happening. The response they received was, Do not dig through the dismiss. Had Zeus wished it to be an island, he would have made it thus himself. And with that, the Canidians stopped digging and gave themselves up without resistance to Harpagus when he arrived at their gates. He then moved eastward into Lycia. Emblematic of this fierce independence that we spoke about earlier, in the extreme, were the citizens of Xanthos in the territory of Lycia. After they fought valiantly against Harpagus' army but were defeated, they retired behind their city's walls. They then burned all of their possessions on the Acropolis and killed their wives, children, and slaves. Having done this, they launched into a suicidal attack upon the superior Persian troops in which they all died, all in order to avoid the humiliation of conquest. Disunited, the Asiatic Greeks were an easy prey. Tribute was imposed upon them, as well as the burden of serving in the Persian army when such service was required. But no restrictions were placed upon the freedom of their commerce. Harpagus completed his conquest of the Greek polis of Asia Minor in 542 BC, but he wouldn't be finished there. Continuing eastward, he next subdued the region of Cilicia, and then moving south into the Levant, Harpagus led his army against the ancient port cities of Phoenicia. After withstanding centuries of assault by the Assyrians and Babylonians, the Phoenicians found themselves virtually defenseless against Persia's innovative siege tactics. Harpagus' success led to another unforeseen consequence, as a second massive exodus of Phoenicians fled for the security of Carthage and their other colonies. Those who remained behind would soon find themselves compelled to embrace a new and prosperous role as shipbuilders and navigators for the Persian navy. Afterwards, Harpagus was appointed a satrap of Asia Minor. While Harpagus completed his conquest of Anatolia and the Levant, Cyrus was off campaigning in the east beyond the Sagros Mountains. Taking the Khorasan Road deep into Persia, he led forces against the nomadic steppe tribes of Iran and Central Asia. After six years of constant campaigning, he earned control over the territory running from the Aral Sea in the north to the Hindu Kush in the south. He successfully expunged the primal Persian fear for the Scythians, who had dominated them for decades. The newly subdued Scythians would prove to be among the most brutal and effective of the empire's shock troops. They also wore tall pointy hats and used cannabis and liked to brag about drinking the blood of enemies, using their scalps as napkins. Wherever Cyrus went, he portrayed himself as the living embodiment of ancient Aryan traditions and gave local tribal chiefs wide latitude over his overarching rule. This approach won him a broad and sable buffer zone to the northeast, secured to the Jaxartes River by a series of seven Persian forts. With his northeastern frontier firmly secure, Cyrus was free to return his focus to unfinished business in the west. After just only ten years, nobody had conquered so much as quickly as Cyrus had, and in fact Babylon was the last major power in western Asia that was not yet under Persian control. The Egyptians and Carthaginians of North Africa were still there too, but those will be the topic of next episode. So in 540 BC, when Cyrus had captured the territories of the old Elamite kingdom and its capital Susa, which were under Babylonian control on the eastern part of their kingdom, it became very clear to Babylon's current king, Nabonidus, that Cyrus intended to keep pushing west and that he would be his next target. He ordered the cult statues from the outlying Babylonian cities to be brought into the capital. Herodotus says the name of Babylon's king was Labanitis. They sound similar, and the change in spelling could simply reflect the occasional tendency in ancient Greek to change the letter and sound from nu, or n, to lambda, or l. Babylon's great days had ended with the death of Nebuchadnezzar II. His successors were weak and ineffectual, and that trend continued with Nabonidus. He was a scholar who was poorly equipped to give Babylon the leadership that it desperately needed in the face of such Persian aggression. Anyways, the main contemporary source for Cyrus's Mesopotamian campaign is the so-called Nabonidus Chronicle, named because it deals primarily with the reign of Nabonidus. It attributes Babylon's ultimate conquest by the Persians as punishment for Nabonidus having rejected their supreme deity, Marduk, in favor of the moon god, Sin, 
The strongly anti nabonidus tone of these cuneiform tablets suggests that their authors, the Babylonian priests, were alienated from their king and may have welcomed a Persian takeover. Also, Babylon had been suffering severe economic problems, exacerbated by plague and famine. Furthermore, because he had spent so much time outside the city to conquer the northern Arabian tribes, Nabonidus had to leave his son, Belshazzar, and commanded the city in his absence, and he was widely seen as arrogant and cruel, and had a special affinity for abusing the displaced inhabitants of Judah. This was the apparent situation in Babylon that made it ripe for Cyrus's picking. So in the fall, 539 BC, Cyrus marched his enormous army down from the Zagros Mountains, along the Diala River, towards the eastern bank of the Tigris River. Nabonidus dispatched his son, Belshazzar, at the head of a large Babylonian army, and the two sides met at Opus. This city is thought to have been a preferred point to cross the river, as Xenophon described a bridge being located there. It also was a place of considerable strategic importance. It sat at the northern end of the wall that Nebuchadnezzar II had built several decades earlier, and thus control of Opus would have enabled Cyrus to break through the wall and open the road to the capital. The Nabonidus Chronicle, unfortunately, gives very little detail about the events of the battle. The outcome, though, was clearly a Babylonian defeat, possibly even a rout. Belshazzar's fate is unclear, but he probably was killed in battle. The Babylonian defeat at Opus appears to have ended any serious resistance to Persia. Fourteen days later, Cyrus captured Sippar without battle. While Cyrus remained in Sippar, he dispatched a small body of troops under Gabrias, Gubaru, an old Persian, south along the Tigris, and they entered Babylon without a battle two days later. Because the citizens of Babylon despised Nabonidus, they welcomed the Persians as liberators and handed him over to Gabrias. Hearing this, the Babylonian army surrendered in mass. Gabrias made sure, per Cyrus's orders, that the Persian forces committed no looting, violence, or any other offensive acts against the Babylonians. When Cyrus entered the city 17 days later, he was heralded as king by the Babylonians. The fate of Nabonidus is unclear. Later traditions say that he was spared, like Astyages in Croesus, and he went into exile in Carmania, a province in southeastern Persia, where he died years later. The Greek accounts of Herodotus and Xenophon differ quite significantly from the Nabonidus Chronicle, though. Herodotus doesn't even mention the Battle of Opus, instead stating that the two armies met outside of Babylon. The Babylonians were defeated and forced to retreat behind their walls. But they were prepared for a long siege, and Cyrus was unable to penetrate their walls. So he came up with a creative idea. Under the cover of darkness, and during a night that the Babylonians were celebrating a religious festival, he ordered these men to dig a channel to redirect the flow of the Euphrates into a large ditch, lowering the river's level just low enough that they could sneak in under the city's gate. The Babylonians, meanwhile, had no idea this was taking place. Babylon was so large that long after the outer portions were taken, those in the center continued to sing and dance in the religious festival until they were informed that the city was captured. So as you can see, the difference in these accounts suggests that the Greek historians were drawing on or perhaps inventing, different traditions. Regardless, the city was now under possession of Cyrus. He also received the entire area in the Levant that was under Babylonian control. He wisely attributed his success to the invitation of Marduk, and the Babylonian priests embraced him. With the conquest of Media, Lydia, and Babylonia, the three successor Near Eastern empires that succeeded the Assyrian Empire were defeated by Cyrus in just 11 years. After taking Babylon, Cyrus proclaimed himself King of Babylon, King of Sumer and Akkad, King of the Four Corners of the World, in the famous Cyrus Cylinder, an inscription deposited in the foundations of a temple dedicated to this chief Babylonian god Marduk. The text of the cylinder denounces Nabonidus as impious and portrays the victorious Cyrus pleasing the god Marduk. It describes how he treated newly conquered peoples with compassion and freedom. It describes how Cyrus had improved the lives of the citizens of Babylonia, repatriated displaced peoples, and restored temples and cult sanctuaries. It also describes how he treated newly conquered peoples with compassion and freedom. One line in particular says, From Asher, Susa, Akkad, Eshnunna, and Gutium, to the holy cities beyond the Tigris, whose sanctuaries had been ruined, I returned their gods who had resided there. I gathered all of their inhabitants and returned them to their dwellings.
This is used to corroborate the Hebrew accounts in the Old Testament that all Jews in Babylonian captivity were allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, even being allowed to take back much of the treasures that Nebuchadnezzar II had looted. Then again, they could also be repeating what may have been propaganda from Cyrus to bolster his territorial claim in Judah. Regardless, he was a very rare figure in the Jewish tradition, being a Gentile who was given the honorific title of Messiah. The rest of the cylinder essentially guarantees religious freedom to everyone within the empire and gives permission to any wrongfully enslaved people to return to their homeland. It's a beacon of light in an otherwise intolerant time, leading some to call this the world's first human rights charter. The Persian military had been extremely effective in bringing together numerous earlier states and empires under one rule, and had done so quite swiftly. Its main strength seems to have been in its size, an aspect that Greek authors certainly exaggerated. The army, though, could draw upon an enormous population for its soldiers and sailors, and successfully coordinated the different populations with their specific military skills. This massive Persian army consisted of archers and light cavalry, with the bulk of it being the infantry that was made up of drafted men of fighting age, from all over the provinces, who carry simple weapons and armor. They did not wear heavy armor like the Greeks. Face paintings show them wearing pants, but having no armor and carrying wicker shields. Cyrus also founded an elite military unit of 10,000 native Persians, known as the Immortals, composed of heavy infantry, and used both as an imperial bodyguard and a standing army. Their name derived from the fact that every slain member was immediately replaced to keep their numbers constant. But in Persian, they were called Anusiwa, meaning companions, which Herodotus is confused with Anasa, or immortals. Anyways, they wore clad and flexible iron-scaled armor under a durable double tunic, with a headdress that can be pulled down to shield their face against dust. The typical Persian attack was threefold. First, they barraged the enemy with arrows from a distance. As they marched closer, they used their spear to keep them at bay. When that failed, they turned to their sword and wicker shield for close combat. Babylon, still strong and culturally prominent, had been spared the ravages of an all-out war with the Persians. Virtually from its foundation, the city had served as a major locus of Near Eastern power, either as an imperial capital or at the very least as a sacred city. Although it would remain a cultural mecca for centuries, the arrival of the Persians signaled the end of Babylon's central role in the politics of the Near East. Important figures over the next decade, such as Gobrias and then Cyrus's own son, Cambyses II, were appointed to govern Babylon, but the Persian Empire would instead become a multi-state empire governed from four capital states. In addition to Babylon, there also was Susa and Ecbatana. The fourth capital, Basargadai, would be built entirely anew at a location south of the Zagros, in the former Elamite land. Construction had begun soon after the conquest of Lydia, and would continue over the remainder of Cyrus's reign. But it would be where Cyrus took up residence, when he wasn't off campaigning, that is. Surrounded by high defensive walls, it featured a fortified citadel, several majestic palaces, and a number of other monumental buildings. It also included a cult area for the worship of the Persian god Ahura Mazda. More on that religion in a future episode. The many open spaces of the city were filled with expansive, luxurious gardens and a network of irrigation canals to upkeep them. In fact, the old Persian word paradesa passed through the Greek paradisos to give us the English word paradise. The Persians were extremely fond of such gardens and planted them in all of the major cities throughout their empire. The garden at Pasargidae had over 1,000 yards of carved limestone, designed so that the water could enter small basins every 16 yards. The engineering behind these paradisa laid the foundations for many of the modern world's magnificent gardens, with the application of geometric and floral designs, cypress trees, wild grasses, roses, lilies, and all kinds of wild vegetation. It was the concept of the modern park as we know it. While his skill as a conqueror was legendary, Cyrus also showed equal ability in the political management of his empire. In continuity with Assyria, the Persians ruled over their territories through vassal kings, or directly via Persian governors called satraps, who reported back to the Persian king. While the Persian empire was highly centralized, it still was respectful of the differences of the people that it governed. And thus, it was the first empire that acknowledged the fact that its inhabitants had a variety of cultures, spoke different languages, and were politically organized in various ways. 
In contrast, while the Assyrians too had to incorporate numerous peoples and cultures, their ideology strove to erase their differences and make them Assyrians once they were conquered. It's not that the Persians didn't have a unique culture of their own, but no matter how much they lived by it personally, they never made any attempt to impose their traditions, values, or beliefs on any of their subject peoples. They did not try to make them Persian. Furthermore, they even strived to uphold local traditions that had been neglected or abused by those previously in power. In victory, they adopted native titles, fulfilled customary obligations, and gave every outward appearance of cultural understanding and respect. This approach met with near-universal success in both granting Persian rule legitimacy and minimizing the resentment of their subject peoples. In a similar vein, the Persians also practiced universal religious tolerance, patronizing and protecting local cults and frequently associating their actions with divine inspiration from a deity of the subdued peoples. This innovative policy, coupled with his personal charisma and military skill, enabled Cyrus to assume control over a vast empire made up of dozens of subjected peoples over an incredibly short time span. Granted, the process was facilitated by long centuries of imperial rule in the Near East, but where the Assyrians had been despised, the Persians were loved. Cyrus's exceptional qualities were praised by the Greek historian Xenophon in his Cyropedia, or Kuru Padea in Greek. Padea means education, and thus it is a partly fictional biography of the education of Cyrus. Essentially, this work is a political romance, describing the education of the ideal ruler. Education here doesn't mean formal learning, but his life's work. It describes Cyrus's heroism in battle and governance and his abilities as a king and a legislator. It is generally agreed that Xenophon did not intend this work to be taken as history, though, and thus its validity can be questioned. Regardless, it does offer a glimpse, albeit possibly embellished, of the character of Cyrus. He is portrayed as the ideal ruler, and this wouldn't have been made possible if there had not been a credible memory of Cyrus as an ideal ruler, or a very good ruler at the least. Xenophon had been in Persia as part of the March of the Ten Thousand, more on that in a future episode, so it is possible that the stories he paints were recounted to him firsthand by Persian court society. Classical authors believe that Xenophon composed this work with his version of the ideal ruler in response to the Republic of Plato, or possibly vice versa. Not much is known about Cyrus' actions during the decade following his capture of Babylon. The standard assumptions are administration, consolidation, and ongoing warfare, but useful details are lacking. The Persians themselves didn't describe every campaign and reliefs on the walls of their palaces, like previous Near Eastern empires. The East most likely demanded the bulk of their attention, though. When the Persian Empire was involved with the highly literate civilizations of the Hebrews and Greeks, these activities were highly documented, sometimes by multiple sources, and in great detail. Whereas the East remained the home of illiterate tribal nomads, where even the most epic of battles or most notable of achievements could only be carried down through the less reliable medium of oral tradition. What is known, though, is that he had extended his dominion in the north, over the territories of Armenia, up to the Caucasus Mountains, and in the east, into the midst of Afghanistan, with the territories of Sogdiana, Bactria, Arachosia, and Dragiana. Herodotus does tell us that his last enterprise took place in 530 BC, as he campaigned north of the Jaxartes River to the east of the Caspian Sea, and beyond the far northeastern corner of his empire, against the Masagetai. They were a distant Scythian tribe who roamed about parts of modern-day Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, western Uzbekistan, and southern Kazakhstan. They were ferocious warriors who drank horse blood, and when worshipping their only deity, the sun, they whipped themselves up into a frenzy of song and dance by throwing cannabis plants into a bonfire. They also engaged in intercourse out in the open, like animals. When a Masagetian died, they stewed his meat and feasted on it, unless he died from some disease, because they believed this was the most blessed way to end one's life. They subsisted only on animals and fish, no crops whatsoever. At least this all is what Herodotus reports. As usual, take it with a huge grain of salt. In any event, at this time, the Mesegetai were ruled by their queen with the name of Tamiris, as the Greeks transcribed her name, that is. Her husband had recently died, so Cyrus sent a message to her, in which he offered to marry her and combine their two nations, but she refused his proposal. So having failed with diplomatic overtures, he led his army to the Jizarsix River 
which marked their border, and declared war by constructing a bridge of boats that allowed his army to cross the river. While he was building the bridge, Tamiris sent a herald to him with the offer that he should cease what he was doing and just allow the Mesagatai to cross the river and fight him in Persian territory. All of Cyrus's advisors recommended this course of action, except for one. Croesus argued that if he permitted her to enter Persian territory and was defeated, he would risk losing the entire empire as they would surely continue on their march. And vice versa, if he defeated them in Persian territory, he would not gain as much from the victory as he would have done so on their own land, as he would be able to advance directly into the heart of their territory. He also proposed that since the Massagetai have had no experience of Persian luxury, they should slaughter many cattle and prepare a feast at their camp. When everything is prepared, they should leave behind a small fraction of the army while the rest retreat to the river. Because, Croesus argued, when the Massagetai see the feast taking place, they will be distracted and thus create an opportunity for the Persians to pounce. Cyrus liked Croesus' plan very much, so he sent a message to Tamiris telling her that he planned to cross into her territory. Then he placed his son, Cambyses II, whom he intended to be his heir, into the custody of Croesus and sent them both back to Persia. That night, Cyrus had a vision in which Darius, the eldest son of Hystaspes, bore wings on his two shoulders, one casting a shadow over Asia and the other over Europe. When he awoke, he determined that Darius must be plotting against him, so he summoned Hystaspes and sent him back to Persia to keep an eye on his son. At least this is what Herodotus records. This is most likely a creation of propaganda that was later spread by Darius after he did in fact become king, but that is a story for a future episode. Then, Cyrus followed through on Croesus' plan. Once the feast was prepared, he ordered a small contingent of soldiers to stay behind and guard the supply of wine, while the main force set up an ambush. Meanwhile, Tamiris' son, Spargapissus, had led one-third of the Massagetian army to meet the Persians. They easily scattered the small Persian force and proceeded to help themselves to the food and wine. The pastoral Scythians were not used to drinking wine, though, as their favored intoxicants were cannabis and fermented mare's milk. So after they became quite intoxicated, almost to the point of unconsciousness, Cyrus pounced and scored an easy victory, killing many of them and capturing the Mesagetian prince alive. When word of this reached Tamiris, she sent him a dire warning to give back her son and leave content with a triumph over a third of her army, or she will give him more blood than he can drink for all of his gluttony. Cyrus refused to leave, but he allowed himself to be convinced by Spargapissus to release him from his chains and let him go. But no sooner did he do so, the prince found an unintended spear and plunged it into his gut, killing himself. Upon learning of her son's death, Tamiris flew into a rage. She sent a message to Cyrus announcing his treachery and mobilized every single warrior under her command to move on the Persian army. Herodotus says that in his opinion, what happened next was the most violent of all battles ever fought by barbarians up to this point. The battle began with each side shooting arrows at each from a distance. Then, when their supply of arrows was exhausted, they attacked each other at close quarters with spears and daggers. For a long time, both sides fought fiercely and held their ground. But after an extremely long and bloody battle, the Massagetai stood victorious. A large part of the Persian army perished in the battle, including their king, Cyrus. Finding his corpse, the queen Tamiris decapitated him, and then plunged his head into a wineskin filled with blood, saying, I am alive and I have conquered you in battle, but you have ruined me by taking my son through trickery. Drink, you insatiable monster, until your murderous thirst is satisfied. This symbolic gesture of revenge for his bloodlust and the death of her son is questioned by many scholars, naturally, mostly because Herodotus admits this event was one of many versions circulating about the death of Cyrus, but he only mentioned this one because he deemed it was the most likely. Herodotus' version either is incorrect or somehow Cyrus' body was eventually recovered and returned to Pasargidae, where it was buried. Furthermore, Xenophon contradicts him, saying that Cyrus died peacefully at his capital. A number of other later sources also report a different cause of death. Anyways, the tomb at Pasargidae, attributed to Cyrus, resembles the humility of its owner. It's relatively unadorned and very simple in style. His engineers built the tomb with very heavy stones. They began by using large rectangular cut stones and used ramps, pulleys, and clamps to build the tomb to its height of 36 feet, 
It's a very simple, outwardly modest monument for someone who had created the world's largest empire to that date, and it's still remarkably well-preserved to this day. Anyways, Cyrus died in 530 BC after reigning for 29 years. The empire he left behind was the largest the world had ever seen at that point. The Achaemenid, or Persian Empire, stretched from Asia Minor in the west to the northwestern regions of India in the east. For his deeds and his exceptional qualities, Cyrus would earn the moniker The Great. His abilities as a conqueror and administrator held an almost mythic role amongst the Persian people, similar to that of Romulus in Rome, or Moses for the Israelites. Due in part to the political infrastructure that he created, the Achaemenid Empire endured long after his death. Not only that, but it would continue to expand under his next two successors, whose reigns will be the subject of the next two episodes. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 32, Cambyses. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes on your phone or listening device every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Finally, now that the show has gained some traction, I decided to create a Patreon page in case anyone felt inclined to contribute to the creation of the History of Ancient Greece podcast. There is a link on the right-hand side of the website. But don't worry, the podcast will still remain free regardless. But it is an expensive endeavor to create a podcast after all, with the cost of website hosting and the purchasing of equipment and the time and effort required to research, write, record, and edit a show. So if you're feeling generous, consider supporting the show by making a monthly donation. If you'd rather just do a one-time donation, there is also a PayPal link on the right-hand side of the website. Just click on the Donate button. Patreon allows you to pledge money, either for every episode or per month. It can be as little as a dollar a month if you please. That amounts to a can of soda or a cup of tea or coffee a month. And while it may seem insignificant, if many people pledge that amount, it can really add up quickly. Either way, I would be eternally grateful. Speaking of which... I would like to give a huge thanks to listener Al Ozanoff, Andrea Peterson, Patrick G., and Alex for their pledges. I cannot tell you enough how thankful I am for your support. And once again, thanks to everyone else for your continued support in making this podcast, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled Dryads, Nymphs of the Forests from his album The Liar of Hermes. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientliar.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.